being able to integrate architecture and nature, right? Combining those two, that's what we're always chasing, right? We're always chasing that opportunity to create that experience for the next person. Welcome to Titans of Trade. I'm your host, Costasun, and today we welcome an architect who is not only creating amazing buildings, he is also shaping communities and careers as well. Welcome, Kevin Holland. Hi, Costas. Thank you for having me. <laughs> yeah, you know, it, the challenge here will be, I have so much I want to talk with you about, um, so I'll have to make sure I like, because we could talk through the weekend. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so you're in Los Angeles now, and it's You've done so many different projects throughout the country, and now you're in LA because you're with HMC, you're the principal in charge. And I'm curious about just as not just a person, but also an architect, what is uh, interesting to you about the city? Like what's like, huh, this is different. Okay, okay, architecturally. Um, you know, I will say I will say that for a city of its size, I would love to see more iconic high rise buildings. Uh, you know, we're not as dense as Chicago and New York. And and um, uh, there are a few Fortune 500s here in the county, but but I believe only three of them are in the city. And mm -hmm. so as a result, our our our, uh, our high rises, we don't have as many iconic mm -hmm. uh, uh, high rises as, say, New York City, which you would mm -hmm. expect of a city the size of size of Los Angeles. We do right. have some really great ones, right? The right. US Bank building, uh, actually the building that, which is the building that my firm is in, our firm is in, uh, as well as the uh, the Intercontinental Hotel, which is a yeah, fabulous yeah. building uh, in downtown Los Angeles. Um, and so so that's, that's the thing the that surprised me when, it, when, I, when I got here, but, but I'd be remiss if I made that sound like the city of Los Angeles does not have great architecture and it has phenomenal Phenomenal, fantastic architecture. Uh, many other iconic buildings. Uh, L.A. City Hall, which yeah. everyone has seen. You know, opening credits of maybe your favorite detective show based in Los Angeles, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, the Getty out in Santa Monica. Uh, the Griffith Observatory. Rafael Maneo has a beautiful cathedral of the ladies. C mm -hmm. Cathedral of Our Ladies of the Angels. Mm -hmm. uh, that church is just off of the 101 in downtown. Uh, Frank Gehry has the Disney Concert Hall, yeah. another iconic building, and then of course the um, the International Theme Building out at LAX, which is a uh, Paul Williams, ah. which is a Paul Williams project. Uh, <laughs> and so between uh, the Theme Building and and the Concert Hall, those are probably two of the most iconic buildings, not just in Los Angeles but potentially in the world. Right. Um, right. And LA is, I've always said, LA is certainly the home of the custom residential. Right. Yeah. There's yep. a lot of beautiful houses in the hills and there's a lot of great firms that are that are doing work in, in, in that space. Yeah. You know, it's funny about that point you talk about the custom homes is it always occurred to me in Los Angeles that it's kind of a place where people come from all over the world to make their dreams come true. Right. And then sure. when it when it happens, they hearken back to the image in their mind of what what success would be and what their house would look like, right? And then they create that dream house and there you have it. You know? That's right. That's right. This, is, this, is, this is the place to do it. Yeah. This is the place to do it, right? And there's enough, there's enough hillside that uh, not only can you design the home of your dream, but then you have, you have fantastic views. Right, right. right. You know, once, once, you're up in the, once you're up in the hills, and there's, like I said, there's a lot of hills surrounding Los Angeles. Right. So there's a lot of people who have beautiful views of either the valley to the north or the basin, or the yeah. basin to the south, which is uh, where the city of Los Angeles that resides in the basin. Right. And so... I know you work in so many areas, not just as an architect, but you're also very, you're very involved in kind of this idea of connecting with communities. So connecting designs to communities, which I think is very important for a slew of reasons. Oh, um, sure. And uh, I, I'm curious about how that started for you. Um, well, it, let's see. Yeah. So if we go all the way back, my interest in architecture at a very young age was just based on the fact that I loved to draw and it just seemed like a really cool thing to do, right? Uh, I didn't have any, I didn't have, I didn't start off with noble intentions, right? I was a kid, looks like, looks like something I can do and, and, and it should be fun. Um, but um, 
as I got <laughs> older, once I, once I entered college, um, I became extremely fascinated with, with Frank Lloyd Wright's uh, Falling Water and, and realized, yeah. and, and in the back yeah. of my mind, I realized, yeah. yeah, that was a house that he designed for a very wealthy family, the Kaufman mm-hmm. family uh, out, of, out of Pittsburgh. Um, then I became really interested in um, museums done by Richard Meyer, like the Athenaeum or or the High. And again, in the back of my mind, I realized, yeah, this is something that was done for for a uh, very wealthy uh, uh, patron base, right? And so I start to realize, wait a minute, you know, there's there's an entire population of people who aren't necessarily um, being served on a regular basis, mm-hmm. right? I mean. We do what we can within the profession, but I kind of realized, you know, I'd, I'd like to, I'd like, I'd love to do those museums. I, I, I'd love to do those custom homes for those who live in the hills. But I realized that there was a community of people who I wasn't necessarily doing work for, and so I was right. trying to figure out how right. do I, how do I do that? How do I begin to engage them? And and so for me, the first. Uh, um, the the project type that initially allowed me to serve that community was education, right? Education K twelve, mm-hmm. uh, even education higher ed. But K twelve is is um, you know it's very it's very it's very democratic, right? It's it's it serves it serves the larger community and not just a very specific uh, uh, client base or, or or patron base, right? Right. Um, and so once I, I I found out that was that was that was the way architecturally that I could begin to contribute to to uh, to the community, whether it was right. the community I was directly or immediately from, right. or or any of my new adopted communities, because I've lived right. in a few places. I've lived in yeah. Ohio as well as California. Right. And so you also have done a lot of work K through twelve, and then like healthcare is another area where you have like a lot of experience. And I'm kind of curious how a person who's a designer, right, or an architect, and they're wanting to integrate other points of view, all points of view, or as many points of light out there in the community as they could, what are some kind of tactics, some kind of strategies that you could hear from people who who might not be used to making their voices heard? Or, or like connecting with these groups and, and getting their information, you know, while you're getting the design. I know that's very broad, but I sure, don't care. Sure. Well, not as much in healthcare because there, there we're focused on the healthcare system. They're our client. We normally talk with them about what their goals are, what mm-hmm. their needs are, what their objectives are. And we do that with everyone, mm-hmm. but, but it's the, it's, more of the public projects where the community involvement is is sought after. Yeah. And in some of those projects where it's not sought after, there tends to be problems. Right. Is that at, some right? Point, at some point, at some point someone's going to say, well, you never talked to us about it. And and so um, um, we don't necessarily uh, um, agree with your design solution or or even that the project should exist here. Right. So schools Schools rely on school boards. School boards rely on the public, mm-hmm. right? So it's obvious when you're doing a school project for us that we're always going to have to have some community engagement, right? Right, in which we in which we're looking to solicit uh, ideas and responses, not not necessarily in the design, but in the impact and the outcome, right? right. What, what are you looking for there, right? Um, uh, we want this type of feel. We want it. We want a. We want a school that will also serve as a community center. So we don't mm-hmm. necessarily get in. We don't. We don't necessarily speak with the 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 community about their design preferences, mm-hmm. right? But just what's the function of the building? How do, how do you want to engage with the building? And and that and that conversation is going just as much to the school board as it is to us because in the end, on a school project, the school is our client. Mm-hmm. Right. We're just all smart enough to realize that there is a um, there is another client who may not be paying any of the invoices, but there's another client and they're called mm-hmm. the public. Right. right. And so and so any opportunity that we have to engage them and, and to hear their thoughts, we'll take that um, and, and we'll decipher we'll decipher intent and meaning. And then we'll try to try to come up with a solution that right. that meets 
not only what the not only the the school's criteria, but also let's try to meet some of the criteria of the public that that this building will be will be um, will be serving. Connecting the spirit of a community to a building, I think, mm -hmm. is particularly important. And I'm just talking about the aesthetics right now because mm -hmm. there's such a homogenization. Like I remember in the past when I traveled for work, you know, you might want to go pick something up at a boutique for like my niece or something, you know. Let's sure. just say yeah. you're in Indianapolis and you want to get something that's different that she can't find in Boston. You know, sure. and you notice more and more it's just you know, you didn't go to a city to go look at a chain store, you know, and there's a lot of that now, you know, you yeah. see a lot of homogenization. And I think so it's important what you're doing is um, echoing, I guess, or, or mirroring what is the spirit yeah. of a community. And also that also integrates the past as well, preservation. It's very interesting. Um, but, and, and I'm sorry, I, it's a long way around talking about something called equity justice. And if you could just kind of tell us what that's about or design justice, rather. There are probably multiple, multiple definitions. Um, you know, I've, I've heard design equity. I've heard design justice. I've heard environmental justice. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, it can be a really, really broad uh, tent that encompasses all sorts of all sorts of uh, attempts to just be fair in the built environment, right? So if I had right. to sum it up, that's it, right? It's being fair in the built environment, right? right? Now, now, what does that mean? What does that mean? Well, well, there are. Let's take um, let's take Flint, Michigan, okay, right? Um, um, and the contaminated contaminated water, right? Well, there's a, well, there is a community that is that is greatly impacted by that contamination more so than say other communities. Mm -hmm. So the environmentally just thing, taking environmental justice, the, envir the environmentally just thing to do is to rectify the amount of contamination in the water, replace the, the lead line pipes, uh, and then on the back end also to provide medical care for those people who have been affected, right? You don't just, you don't just resolve the problem and say, okay, well, there's no more lead and our, our, our you know, we're, we're, we're done. We wipe our hands right. clean because right. now there has been an impact to some people. Some people have been damaged. Some people have been hurt. And so the, 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 the restitution and making people whole is the other part of, of, of justice, whether it's environmental justice, design justice, whatever, whatever, whatever adjective you want to put in front of the word justice, right? Restoring people to being whole is also mm -hmm. a part of it. And right. so design justice is just designing fair and equitable spaces uh, for people, and 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 in many cases, it is correcting correcting a previous wrong. Interesting. Now, HMC has a it's like a working premise, I guess, or philosophy called designing for good. Is that right? So that yeah, cool. and and it and it's it's so 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 many of the projects. And I I saw that HMC was involved with like a competition related to. It was, I'm sorry. Tell tell us about it because it was very interesting because it goes into this idea of recalling the past, forgotten communities, and bringing that to light in a very a very interesting way. And I and I'm curious about you telling us, you know, how the firm was involved, how you were involved. Okay, I did I did not have much involvement. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, in fact, it's fair to say I had I had almost zero involvement. Uh, other than other than I sat with um, uh, um, some of our emerging professionals who actually led this project. Let me let me start there. This project um, we, we we won a merit award, AIA California Merit Award, uh, which is which is uh, a very distinguished uh, honor, and we're we're extremely pleased with that. Mm -hmm. um, but that was in the professional category. So there, there was a there was a high school, a college, a grad student, mm -hmm. uh, and then a professional. And so we won the merit award. We won that with emerging professionals, meaning uh, these were some of our most junior staff members who put this project together yeah. and on a national scale took a second place award, right, against firms who more than likely had their design principles involved, uh, some more experienced people. So these are these these were some of our these were some of our younger and some of our youngest. Uh, uh, emerging professionals, and so I'm always excited every time. Every time I think of the fact that we placed that highly with that 
with with a team that young. But but the award was the, the project was um, the AIA California sponsored, and it was also sponsored by um, I believe um, SoCal Edison, San Diego Energy, a couple of utility, few utilities uh, were also part of that. But um, the competition engaged uh, architects. Uh, designers, engineers, planners um, in the pursuit of sustainable design and uh, attempted to celebrate the decarbonization, uh, decarbonization, decarbonization excuse me, and equity. Uh, the challenge this year was to design an agriculture center for Allensworth, California, which was California's yeah. first African-American town, uh, which unfortunately was intentionally, was intentionally stripped of its local train stops grocery wow. stores and water rights um so it was, it was stripped of those things which essentially uh um turned what was once what was once a once thriving community into a forgotten barren land and and very much like plant plant was uh, was plagued with um arsenic contamination um and so that was the site that was the site that was chosen um and so we were really proud of our of our response um, to um, to to the issues to the issues there in 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 Allenworth. And so extremely pleased that we were able to win that uh, win the merit award for that. You know, you mentioned that one of your first, I guess, interests was falling water, like the, the perfection of falling water. I was there a few weeks ago and you know how you walk over to the side of the building and there's that view, you know, the view with the, the view, and, yeah. and it's, and it's just, it's perfection, isn't it? It is. It if, is. If one aspect, you know, if one of the, I guess, I don't know if it's a balcony or, you know, was out a half of a foot, it wouldn't be that perfection. Like, you could sit there and look at falling water, the perfection of it for, for, I just, you could just be there forever. Right. And, and I'm curious when you, when did you meet falling water? I, I met falling water in a publication when I was 17 or 18. Um, mm -hmm. uh, the summer before, the summer before I started college at the University of Virginia, I interned with the DuPont company in my hometown. Of uh, Wilmington, Delaware, and my manager at the time was a woman named uh, Bonnie Williams, and she knew that I was going to UVA to study architecture. So, in fact, because of her, I met my okay. first architect. She 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 made me take time off from work to go meet with some architects that she knew. Uh, mm -hmm. She set that up, and then she also gave me a publication, and it and and this article was on falling water. And it was absolutely <laughs> phenomenal, right? I still remember looking at the first image. And then when I saw that it was built in 1929, I, I was floored, right? I was, I was absolutely convinced that it was a contemporary building built sometime in my lifetime, mm -hmm. right? And if not in my lifetime, just shortly before, right? right, I, had no, right. I had no idea that at the time I discovered it in, say, 1984, that that building was already, that building was already 60 years old. Right. Uh, but I visited, I visited some time ago and, and to your point, I mean, it's, it's almost a spiritual experience. I mean, being able to, being able to integrate architecture and nature, right. Combining those two, that's the, that's, that's, that's what we're always chasing, right. We're always chasing that opportunity to create that experience for the next person right right, right, right. um and and so it was a beautiful blending of the two uh frank lord wright was certainly ahead of his time um you, well you you've seen it so the terrace the terrace uh <laughs> overlooks the waterfall and then it's it's nestled in in a stand of trees i mean if you think about how that project might might be done in the 21st century. Someone clears out all those trees, right? And even if you're building on top of the waterfall, right, you still, the trees add to the experience, right? And so, and so being able to keep nature as much in, intact as much as possible while shoehorning a building in without ruining or damaging the waterfall at the same time. I mean, it was, it, it was, it was magical. 
It was mad. It, it, it is. And it, it has this um, effect on a person as well, because I noticed that after like the tour, there would people would go up and around and, and go to the I'm sorry, that lookout where you can then see the 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 home from that perspective. And I mm-hmm. noticed that the energy of the people after the tour coming down to look at the house, it was very it was lighter, you know, the energy, the atmosphere. And, and I thought, wow, that that is so fascinating, the power of that house. So obviously there's not necessarily trained architects like yourself who can say, oh, I can see that's perfect because it's A, B, C. Technically, these things were done. It's just everyday people, got little kids, you know, people that are just checking it out. So it has this ability, very powerful. And I'm curious about you understand that power and the works that you work on with communities. So community or civic architecture or what Neutra calls used to call architecture of social concern. I love that description. Um, has that power as well. I know there's there's not a question in there. I just wanted your thoughts on that, on the power of public architecture. Uh, you've well, seen it firsthand, you know, projects you've been involved in. You've seen it can be transformative individually and collectively. And I just yeah, yeah. Well, all architecture, if we if we do it well, mm-hmm. not just public architecture, but all architecture, if we do it well, uh, um, evokes can evoke feelings and and a mood, and we're trying to create an experience, right? Um, and again, that's the thing that we're constantly chasing, right? How to what's the what's the proper combination of spaces? And heights and colors and 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 how do we how do we activate the senses with light and with sound? Um, all those things come into play, um, and 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 if, when we're successful with that, all the architecture, all the all architecture will evoke that that spirit, that mood. Yeah. Uh, and we'll present that that experience that we want, not just public architecture. Now, the public architecture that's that's a that's an arena that we like to one of the arenas we like to focus in right. at uh, at HMC, and we refer to it as uh, as community and culture. Right? Some hey, people right. Call, some people call it civic, uh, which is fine, um, mm-hmm. but we refer to it as um, as um, as community and culture, and and. And I'm going to tie. I'm going to t- tie our design for good uh, into yeah. that because design for good for us um, captures and encapsulates the spirit that we want to invoke in all of our architecture, whether it's our healthcare, mm-hmm. whether it's our education K twelve, whether it's our higher education, or whether it is um, whether it is our community and culture education. Um, the design for good, you could say, design for the greater good, design mm-hmm. for the public good. We've we've redacted it. It's designed for good, but but if you think about it in those terms, um, all of our projects are projects that I like to believe are very democratic. Mm-hmm. They serve they serve a wider base besides the client who is actually who is actually contracted us. To mm-hmm. do the work, right? It serves a greater base. It normally serves the entire community, uh, the county, the state, um, and so you have your your courthouses fall into that. Your city halls fall into that. Your fire stations, your police stations, they fall into that. Museums are also seen as community and culture for us, right? It's a it's a public space. Um, but our healthcare projects, you know, they're providing medical care for a community. Our education K twelve, you know, we're providing. Um, uh, academic learning to to or, or even training to to a group of students. So 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 for us, design for good encapsulates everything we believe about serving the public at large, mm-hmm. not just that single client who may have contracted us. Right. So we're, we're very intentional about about those four practice areas. You know, those are the, those are the areas in which we know and we feel that we're able to do the most good for a larger, for a larger audience and for a larger population. And given your background, I mean, you've been an architect for several decades. You've worked intently in those arenas. 
So this has got to be, in, it has to be interesting being at HMC where they're working in those areas and it's kind of, like you said, intentional designing for good. It's kind of got to be exciting to be part of that. Sure. Because like I said, like I said, uh, when we started um, early on in my career, you know, I, 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 I was in love with, with, with projects um, that may have served a very limited population. Um, the architecture was phenomenal, right? But it, 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 sometime in my career, the wheels start turning and I realize, again, there's this community that's not necessarily being served, or, or at least I haven't had the, let's say that, or at least I haven't had the opportunity to serve that community. Right, right. And I wanted to be able to serve, to serve that community. So it's not necessarily fair to say that the community had not entirely been served, mm -hmm. but- I wanted to be able to to serve to serve that community, and so uh, I was able to pivot and to find some of those project types that enabled me to um, to, to to serve to serve the the community at large. Um, whether it was a school, whether it was a hospital, whether it's any other public facility that falls under our design for good mantra. And you know, with that, you're also involved in the sense of architecture as a vocation because you're at large director from for AIA but you've been involved in AIA for a long time you were president of NOMA National Organization of Minority Architects you're on many boards what I'm curious at what point in your career did you go okay I I design I'm an architect but I'm also interested in shaping architecture as a career choice, you're, you know, you're very involved in the business of architecture and, and, and for young architects as well, or emerging architects. So right. I know that's, but yeah, that's a big question also, but like the shift, what to out here, so what, what, what's planted that seeds? Cause you've been doing it for a long time on a national level in a lot of arenas. So I'm curious. Yeah, I have to, I have to attribute that to, to my grandfather and, and my mother. Uh, mm -hmm. They instilled, they instilled in me through through their example uh, of community service, and so not long after not long after college, I was able to join a join a nonprofit uh, board, and at that point, all I was doing was copying what I what I saw my grandfather do and what I saw my mother do, right? Um, and so that sense of that sense of providing for the person who's coming behind you. Has sort of oh, always wow. been has always been there. So so for me, it's it's just it's it's just how our how our family was 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 cut right. It's 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 what they instilled in me. I see. Um, as far as the and so and so years later, I'm able to still bring <laughs> that that drive, that <laughs> motivation, that desire to the right. AIA National Board, and and so. Um, uh, I do want to. I do want to recognize uh, that um, that has been a. It's, it, it has been. Uh, I'm in my second year, and next year will be my third and final year on the board. But it's been a great honor serving the 96,000 members of the of the AIA as an at large and, uh, at large director. And I really want to thank them for electing me to that position. Um, and we're led by by a dynamic uh, trio of. Um, of uh, young ladies, um, beginning with um, our Madam President, Emily Grandstaff uh, mm. Rice, uh, FAIA, and our Madam President-elect, Kimberly Dowdell, uh, AIA, mm. and then our Madam CEO slash Executive Vice President, Lakeisha Woods, who for a lot of people refer to her as an Executive Director. We refer mm. to her as Executive Vice President. Um, and so that trio leads leads the AIA and, and, and all of our efforts. Um, fortunately, on, not only do I serve on the board, but I also chair our, the AIA's government uh, advocacy mm -hmm. uh, committee. And so um, that gives me an opportunity to kind of even stick my foot in um, federal 
uh, federal lobbying efforts. I mean, we have a staff that takes mm-hmm. care of that. I personally don't have to lobby other than other than what I what I did on our Capitol Hill day in February. Yeah. But, but there were there were there were there were hundreds of us there, right? It wasn't just it wasn't just Kevin. Uh, there were hundreds of us there, and we all got a chance to meet with um, with the uh, legislative staff of the 535 elected members of uh, of Congress. Um, and so, and so we go back to, go back, go back to your question. Uh, it's just been a steady ongoing stream of opportunities to, to continue the thing that, 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 uh, my mother and my grandfather instilled. Right. Right. Um, and so any opportunity I've had, you know, NOMA, okay, yeah, I can join NOMA and I can do this through, through NOMA. Right. And I was able to fortune, I was able to to um to move to the helm of that organization for, mm-hmm. for two sheer, for two short years and then you know someone else's turn right and and then AIA gave me an opportunity to work with them and again bringing all those things that that uh, that uh, my mother and my grandfather and still mm-hmm. I can do that now with the AIA right and right. the AIA is a great platform in which to in which in which to do that yeah it's like the platform yes. and and you're um you've done a lot and it's it's funny. You seem very very humble, like you've. Um, is that is that a family culture thing as well? Uh, my grandfather was extremely humble. Was he? Okay. Extreme, extremely humble. Um, you know, I, I don't. I, I you know, this is about architecture. I don't want to turn this into. You know my family because I can I can do a hashtag my family is better than everyone's. Uh, I I can I can do that and I can spend an hour just talking about the people who 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 instilled in me. But um, but but yeah, my grandfather was extremely extremely humble and 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 I I tell everyone who knows me uh, almost any good thing that you know about me is just me emulating him. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, and um, you know. I have to ask because you you were in DC. You're part of a lot of different organizations, and there's probably opportunities where you get to individually connect with people, mm-hmm. architects, young mm-hmm. architects, people mm-hmm. coming up, and that individual one on one has to be very satisfying. Like, but, could, is there something that you know you've always kind of remembered as something that was you felt you had a lot to do with? helping someone come to architecture it could be even be not a person but a building like you're like that building changed to that community or that you know we you know you were very very effective you've been effective in a lot of ways but just one that was very kind of personal to you that you feel like sharing uh i that one i'm not ready for let's see okay there have been a few i mean you know in through NOMA, through the AIA, uh, I've 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 had I've been blessed with with visibility, mm-hmm. right? And so, um, what has transpired uh, over the past, let's say, eight to ten years, is I'll get okay. I'll get LinkedIn requests from from a student. I've never met this student before, and. I'll get this request and they'll send a message. Um, I, I read about this or, uh, or I heard about this and I'm wondering if you would have time to talk with me about my career. Cool. And, and so that's been very rewarding. I've done yeah. that. I've, I, I've, been, I've been fortunate to be able to do that as well as yeah. University of Virginia asked me a few years ago to serve as a mentor to some of the graduating stu- uh, um, right. with a particular class of students. Um, and they just paired us up with a few students, and we would do this at the University of Virginia, right? Um, sort of, sort of uh, office hours with alumni, right? Uh huh. Um, and so we take the time to to talk with any of those students about anything that they want to talk about in the profession. Some want right. us to look at their portfolio. Uh, some want to talk with us about how do I get. How do I position myself when I graduate to get to get a job? And then others mm-hmm. just want to hear. Hear, hear my story, which it's, I mean, it's, it's my story. I don't know how unique, unique or special it is, right? But it, it, it is my story. I don't mind, I don't mind sharing it with them when they, right. when they ask. And I think that's extreme. That has been extremely rewarding for me. Right, right. Yeah. And, and sharing the story is very helpful. And 
you know, introverts, I guess they don't always enjoy that, but there is, um, sometimes it's easier to reframe it just by saying it's, it's just a, a tool to help other people. And since you're, your objective is like you're very focused on helping others, you know, designing and then helping. Um, I think that can be helpful as well for people that don't love talking to them about themselves or were considered, you know, raised to think it's not correct or, sure. or something. <laughs> That's um, right. I did want to ask about managing the building architecture, your practice with also advocacy with also mentoring AIA work, especially you do this at a high level, you do both at a high level. And I'm curious about that, how how you keep those two worlds kind of moving, the plates in the air. If there's anything that you have as far as like tips, things that you think have been helpful for you? Well, the first tip for anyone who wants to do it is you have to get the buy-in of, of the firm you're with. Uh, because because there's time spent out of the office to do this, and HMC has been has been wonderfully supportive of, of my efforts, even even as it relates to either NOMA uh, mm -hmm. or or the AIA, and so I'm, I'm extremely grateful for that. Um, so once I have that support, now it becomes easy, right? Uh, everyone knows I need to balance. These things I have, I have my responsibilities back at the office. I have my mm -hmm. responsibilities outside of the office, but but because the firm supports my involvement outside of the office, then we sort of we sort of discuss what that means in the office, right? Do I need mm -hmm. do I need to have someone backfill uh, um, a, a a role or some responsibility for me because I I said hey I won't be here on this particular day and right. so I'll need coverage, right? And so we'll work we'll work that out or we'll That's reschedule, awesome. right? Right. right? But but I don't I don't I don't fear having to talk to someone about hey we need to reschedule because I need I'll need to be here now. Right. I also don't want. To leave anyone with the impression that I'm constantly out of the office yeah. uh, because because of the AIA, I'm not right. Mm -hmm. um, but when when those opportunities come up, I am normally gone for maybe two days, two two or three days right. at a time. Uh, February was the last time, and then um, of course we had we had A23, which is the AIA convention. We had that in San Francisco in June. And then mm -hmm. I'll have another board meeting in September, and that board that board meeting board meeting will keep me out of the office Monday and Tuesday of that particular week. Cool, cool. So I know we um, are almost at the end of our time. Could okay. we do a, a bonus round, like a flash round, and just asking you questions, just the quickie ones, you know? Okay, okay. All right, let's do it. Okay. Your fa favorite restaurant in LA so far? Joey DTLA. Where is that? Seventh and Hope. Oh, hello. Okay. Um, do you live downtown, might I, I ask? Do. I do. Oh, oh, that must be fascinating. The Fine. buildings, I right? Walk, I walk to work. I walk to work. It's a four block walk. Oh, nice. Nice, nice, nice. Isn't the history kind of fascinating when you see the old buildings um, from like the 30s and 40s? You know, LA style, because you're from the East Coast. It's, I, am, it's I am from the East Coast. And fascinating. Yeah. There's a lot of beautiful architecture, uh, historic architecture here in here in Los Angeles, and and I think it has been rediscovered. Yes, I think so too. Um, okay, so one of your the projects, one of your past projects that has been in your mind lately for whatever reason, Hampton University Student Center in Hampton, Virginia. Why do you think it's in your mind lately? It stays in my mind. <laughs> really, it's, it's one of my all-time favorites. It was it was my first large project that I led, uh -huh. uh, that I led as the as the uh, as the project architect, um, and so it remains it remains a favorite. Um, a friend of mine, um, friend of mine, just retired as chair of the department there. I just spoke with him just a couple of weeks ago. Um, I have a niece who is actually enrolling. In Hampton oh. in the fall to study architecture, so Hampton has been oh. Hampton has been a topic of conversation <laughs> easily uh, for me and my family oh. just within the past within the past three four months. I have a, I have a cousin mm -hmm. from California. She won't be studying architecture, but she will right. also 
be going to to Hampton. So Hampton has just come up in a lot of conversations uh, in my family over the past over the past four months. That's really great when you can take a picture of them right outside the student center. Right outside but, the student center. Yes. Yeah, that one. So you got you have to frame that, you know, because right. future generations of your family will go, oh yeah, okay. That's so right. um, I notice you wear a lot of really nice suits or clothes attire. Okay. I, I love style and good style. And I'm curious, some of your favorite designers or some of your favorite go-to places for clothes that rarely let you down. Um, wow. Macy's has never let me down. And I live right across the street from Macy's. So nice. uh, that could be dangerous. Um, I will say there is a, there is a newer store. Uh, they don't do as many suits. I, I haven't bought any suits from there, but Bazara is a really, is a really nice store to, to shop in. Some, okay. really, uh, some really nice, nice things for men there. Yeah. What has impressed you the most about HMC so far at the, at the firm as an organization? Uh, great culture, uh, very supportive culture, um, great structure, very great, uh, um, fantastic structure. I mean, during, our on, during the onboarding, uh, you're introduced to, or at least I'm, I was introduced to all the department heads and understood who was responsible for what. And mm-hmm. that's that's really important when you first get to a firm, right? Because right. when you when you first arrive, you don't even you don't you don't know, well, who do I ask for this particular question? Right, you know? right. And, and, <laughs> but it's a it's a it's a it's a great organization, uh great structure from our CEO, from our right. CEO, uh Brian Staten all the way down. Um wonderful culture. Um we are a majority minority firm, mm-hmm. um, and, and and on top of all the other stuff, we we have fun and do nice do and do and do great architecture. Yeah. So when you were back at UVA as an undergrad, what was one of your favorite courses? I know we're going back here, but my favorite courses in undergrad. Yeah, just one that's like that was really helpful. Oddly enough, it could not even, maybe it wasn't even architecture. I took an amazing aerobics class back at Temple. It was bizarrely helpful in ways I would never imagine aerobics could be. <laughs> okay. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, my favorite courses at UVA were not in architecture. Um, the, the, okay, no one's going to believe this. I really enjoyed my calculus class my first year. Um, let's see. I took uh, a class called um, RCS. I don't remember the number, one hundred five something, but it was public mm-hmm. speaking. Phenomenal class. I took a class on constitutional law. Oh, nice! Phenomenal class. Um, uh, the first architecture course that jumped out at me was architectural physics. Loved that class. Okay. I'm that, I'm that kind of guy, I guess. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's the peripherals, right, though, that make up the foundation, right, under, you know. So what what is surprising advice for an architect? Like, if you're uh, thinking about entering architecture, what what is surprising about your field? Something that maybe surprised you when you were just getting into it, that you didn't expect, rather? Uh... Well, we all had a sense that that in order to do architecture, there was going to be a great commitment of time, right? Because we were used to, we were used to that in undergrad. Mm-hmm. Um, now, undergrad, we used to stay up and watch the sun come up, right? I've only had to do that a few times in my mm-hmm. professional career, uh, most primarily because we have just a little longer than they have to complete a project in undergrad. They have fifteen weeks, right? That's if, that's if it's one project for the semester. If it's three projects, then they probably have five weeks, right? And then they're done. They're moving on to the next project. But um, um, let's see. What what was the biggest surprise? I think the involvement of the consultants. And so going from undergrad, we didn't talk a whole – going from – 
school to the profession, we didn't talk a whole lot about the consultants and their role and, mm. and learning how to to coordinate their work and, and to integrate their work because the building the building still needs mechanical systems. It still needs plumbing. It still needs a structural system. Um, and so I think that was the first surprise for me. I mean, I guess in the back of my mind, I knew someone else was responsible, but I didn't quite know how we engaged them. Uh, and so, and so I remember first few meetings, meeting with other consultants, right. And realizing, realizing how that dance goes, right. How much are they leading? How much am I leading? Right. I see. Because I understand what I want this building designed to look like, so that's what I'm leading. I can't lead them on how it's done structurally necessarily. Although okay. years later, I have ideas on how we could do it structurally, right? Right. So I can make suggestions. Mm -hmm. But when I first started, I had to learn. I had to learn that dance, and I think that dance and interacting with other people is the one thing you have to learn. You have to learn. You have to learn how much of it is under your control. How much of it is under someone else's control? Ooh, yeah. And then, and then what's negotiable? Right, right, right. Because some things are not aesthetically. Some some things are not. Um, uh, there are certain things that we have to do on on projects, and the client says, "Well, I don't want to do this." Well, that's the building code. So that's not negotiable. Right, right. That's true. Right, and so and so, same thing working with consultants. Right, some things some things are are within our control. We can have opinions, we can make advice, but in the end, our structural engineer is responsible for the structural component of the building. That's true. That's true. Right. Yeah. Um, last, what's an upcoming? project happening this fall. I know you're in LA, so the seasons, again, that's another weird part of being an East Coast person in LA. You're like, oh, let me get my hats and mittens out. It's like, oh, I don't have to do that. No, um, I don't need to do that at all. I know. It's very weird. I mean, but uh, a project that you're looking forward to, maybe this fall or this winter, it could be in architecture or not in architecture. Well, uh, we're getting ready to start some. We're going to start a study with the uh, city of Manhattan Beach um, uh, for an aquatic facility. I'm looking forward to that. Just just had a conversation with our project manager on that this morning. Um, so I'm really looking forward to to that, and then hopefully hopefully that leads to a larger project. Studies uh, when we're when we're when we do them well, studies will lead to the actual building design project. Okay, um, and so. Looking forward to that. Um, just I'm wrapping up a study right now with uh, Metropolitan Water District. Uh, that's been a great, that's been a great project for us as well. Um, let me say this: the next project, the, uh, um, the project I'm looking forward to, like any other principal in charge, is is the next project. That's cool, exciting, right? Right. We're always, we're always, we're we're always okay. looking ahead to what's what's coming, what's coming down the pike. Because our focus, our we have to sort of be a few steps ahead of everyone else in the practice. That's great. Right? Yeah. So, so while everyone else is focused on the here and now and this project, we have to, we have to, we have to constantly look at how are we filling, how are we backfilling the pipeline? Yeah. Right. So we're always looking, we're always looking for, look, looking for the, for the, for the next project. Yeah. And I love that you're part of shaping public architecture as well. I love that it, it, it's a wonderful, I think, opposition to the homogenization and the blurring out that I see in communities. And it's nice that you're on the, it's nice that you're on the, the job. <laughs> thank you. Thank so you. thank you. And I've kept you way longer than I said that we would. And you probably are like, I'm making you late for a meeting. So thank you so much, Kevin Holland, for joining us on Titans of Trade. We really appreciate what you're doing. Constance, thank you. I greatly appreciate the opportunity.